You are now listening to the Going North Podcast with your host, author and speaker, Dom Brightman. And every Monday and Thursday, you're going to hear the voice of a different author share their stories, expertise, and their struggles that they had to overcome in life to leave you inspired to get more out of your life. Be sure to not only listen to this episode, but share with others, connect with the authors, and always advance others to advance yourself. Now let's get on with the show. It's another round of gratitude on the Going North podcast, and today's awesome shout-out goes to a friend, a mentor, and one of the awesome people in my life that I'm grateful for, Sean Ellsworth Purvis. My man, he is one heck of a good dude. Met him through Toastmasters, really funny guy. He wrote a book called Burn the Box. And he also does a lot of haikus and even has his own ebook that features a hundred of his gold to a million haikus. Not to mention he's also a voice over artist and an overall funny great dude to know. I'm honored to have you in my circle, man. Thanks a ton for your support. Looking forward to all the other awesome stuff that you have planned. And be sure to check him out. He's also The first ever episode of this podcast, episode one, where he talks about his book, as well as using your book as a marketing tool and a business card, as well as some shenanigans, not some shenanigans. But anyways, thanks a bunch, Sean, and keep on doing awesome work, man. And today on the Going North podcast, where we bring you awesome humans from all over the globe who have overcome obstacles to get to where they currently are to inspire you to charge forward and get the most out of your life. Well, today's episode is no different because we have a wonderful MOM on the show, a wonderful mother of 18 wonderful children. That's right, 18. That's right. She's legal in more ways than one, (laughs) y'all. Yep. And in addition to being a mom of 18 kids, she's also a fellow podcaster as well as a blogger and a fellow public speaker too. A minimalist, a healthy lifestyle enthusiast, a runner, a partner, and she's also into cryptocurrency. So not only do we believe in jack of all trades, we have a gen of all trades. So I'm probably going to just cut this intro short and let her dive deep into what makes her the wonderful person that she is. It's the one, the only, Jen with two N's, Taylor. How are you today, ma'am? I am better the second we started talking. So you're making my day, sir. Woohoo! There we go. There we go. That's the name of the game, and that's the aim. Make your day a lot better and not better. Exactly. So I do have 18 kids. That did happen. It was not the plan, but it's been a really fun adventure. And I've chose it one way or the other. And I've really, it's been an adventure. Everything in life is an adventure. So this was no different. Um, Most of the kids are adults now, which is a completely different lifestyle. But there was a time I had three in diapers and two breastfeeding, and I felt like I was always pregnant. And and uh, they were little, and, you know, they grow up. It's just different challenges, but it's been a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. That's right. No breaks for you for a while. <laughs> no, definitely not. Definitely not. I'm a runner. I get a break. See, you already said that. So <laughs> I'm not running away, though. I'm running to maintain some sanity and stay in shape. And uh, running gives me a lot of clarity. And so, see, there you go. I do get away. Oh, no. Nah. You're in the chocolate podcast host zone. There's no escape here. All right. Good. Excellent. That's right. All the dad jokes await for the warrior princess. Exactly. Amen. 
<laughs> you just quoted my book title. So, <laughs> I mean, how could I not totally adore you and be ecstatic about this? You, <laughs> you just quoted. No one knows that but you and I until I said it. But you did quote my book title. Yes. The Warrior Princess. Woohoo! Well, the beautiful thing is you uh, we're able to get to the point where you're confident enough to be able to write that book. So mind diving deeper and telling us who exactly is the wonderful Jen Taylor and how you got to where you currently are. Well, as far as the book goes, you're right. I think it's a shame more people don't write them. Uh, some don't want to. And of the ones that do, about 85% is my understanding of people who don't end up writing it. It takes a lot of guts to write a book. Um, mine's about my life growing up. It's a self-help memoir. I grew up like you would think of foster kids, the same sort of situations. We weren't put into foster care, my sister and I, but I had a third grade teacher that made such a pivotal difference to me in my life. I knew I was worth it. I knew I was important. I smart, beautiful, all of those things that regardless of the fact that life got more difficult after third grade, she just kind of stuck with me. I knew that I was worth it to her. And it taught me that we can make a huge difference in the life of someone else. So I actually, believe it or not, the mom of 18 was told that I would not be able to have children, which is hilarious, of course, because I proved them wrong by 18. Yeah. But I did go through, I, <laughs> I did go through infertility. And I ended up being pregnant seven times and having four and losing three. But that seed that was planted when I was told, I was only 15 when I was told I would probably not be able to have children, which is another odd thing. And even retrospectively doesn't make a lot of sense, but it was a, it was a good thing. First, the doctor was correct um, at the situation, even though I was a 15-year-old girl. But also it planted a seed at that point that if I really wanted a family, there were lots of ways to do it and it didn't have to look any one way. And because of how I grew up, I did foster care for 12 years. So five of those 18 kids are, we call them extras. They never really reunified, but they also never were adopted. So they stayed really long term and four or five of them, well, three or five of them aged out. So then there are five adopted and there are eight biological and there's even a story behind that. So it's been um, unexpected in a lot of ways. I was able to have children. I did have a family. So the things that I was told I wouldn't be able to do, I, I figured out a way out of the box to figure out how. And I used the example of my third grade teacher that we can make an enormous difference in someone's life without ever hearing that we did it. What, you know, without knowing that we made an impact and it can last a really long time. It can be pivotal and completely change. It, it, it altered my entire life trajectory being in her third grade class. So that's a little bit more about Jen Taylor, Warrior Princess. Oh, yeah. It is good that you're here to prove the haters wrong because, I mean, you've been through a lot because, I mean, heck, even the first sentence, it's like, wow, like right out the gate, it's like, boom. It's like you step on a landmine and then your head falls into a bear trap. Kind of. I wasn't, I'm not very subtle, <laughs> I don't think. So yeah, the story's the story. And, and I wasn't subtle about it. I was very honest about my story growing up. And the idea behind that for me, it was altruistic. I thought if someone's read it, if someone, someone reads it and they can relate to it, even if we don't have the same struggles in our lives, if, if they gain tools or tricks or feel less alone or realize that there are other people like them, if it gives them that feeling of being stronger and being able to handle something and that happens to one person, then it was a job well done. Woohoo! Job well done indeed. And the beautiful thing is, you're able to inspire not only the kids, but also the other folks who picked up the book and that are going to pick up the book in the future. That is the plan. That is the master plan, exactly. Yes, indeed. So, what led to the title Warrior Princess? Why not Warrior Queen? That's such a great question. No one's ever asked me, but I'm so glad that you did. 
in the 40s, I believe, is when a man who wrote for comics was asked to create a superhero. And when he was discussing this with his wife and telling him all the characteristics of this superhero and that this superhero led with love, his wife said she should be a woman. And Wonder Woman was created. Wonder Woman's the warrior princess. She leads with her whole platform was to triumph with love. And she has a lasso of truth and all of, I mean, you know, she's an Amazon. She's a badass woman. And she has fighting abilities and superpowers. But her goal was to triumph with love. And that stuck with me so much. I'm five foot nine. So I was called an Amazon in high school and it just about ruined me because I felt like that was such a terrible thing. And then I realized, well, there are these, there, there's Wonder Woman. She's, she's the Amazon, you know, and I grew up watching her and wanting to be Linda Carter, wanting to be just like her. And so I w used Warrior Princess kind of as a platform from the example that Wonder Woman was and how even when somebody calls you an Amazon in high school and your self-esteem is rocked, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. It can be a very good thing because who doesn't want, well, I mean, you might not want to be like Wonder Woman, but I wanted to be like Wonder Woman. So that's where Warrior Princess came from. Yeah, I think I'd probably rather be Stevie Wonder than Wonder Woman. No offense. <laughs> <laughs> I hear it. I'm okay. With, I get it. <laughs> Yeah, well, it will be a painful transition, I imagine. I don't want to. It would, it would be. <laughs> I mean, I'm a woman who's 5'9", so I don't think it'd be quite as painful for me as it would be for you. Yeah, and plus a chick who's 5'9 is hot, at least to me anyway. So it's like, it, it kind of sucks. Like back then, it's like folks would always just make fun of like other folks who may have been abnormal in a way, like they may have been so tall or so short. And then later on, they realize it's actually a gift, but they kind of down themselves for so long that they never realized it was a gift because kids, especially when they get to their teenage years, it's like they're just horrible human beings who haven't found themselves yet. And it could have been that. I mean, this kid walked up to me, and I was taller than most boys in high school, and he said, wow, you're an Amazon. Now, he could have thought that I was 5'9 and hot. I have no idea what his motivation behind making the statement was it, it he might not have had a derogatory intent i didn't stick around long enough to find out because it brings attention to something that you already feel uncomfortable at that age about and i you know i just kind of smiled and nodded and walked away so his intentions could have been very nice i have no idea i think there are certain ages and maybe all ages to some degree where when someone says something to you your reaction that was my reaction it wasn't about what he said it was about how i felt so he he could have had the purest of intent it could have been a compliment and i would never know because i reacted in shame and embarrassed and i it hurt my feelings and that that's me so I think it's important to remember, I mean, looking back on that, yeah, it did hurt my feelings, but it wasn't because he was being directly mean. It was because he made a statement that I was uncomfortable about. And so, you know, when people are directly mean, it's much easier. Then you can just slash tires and beat them up and, you know, <laughs> whatever you need to do. But in that instance, it, it was all about my baggage, not about him. So, that, you know, I'm going to absolutely take the, the fall for that. I think we need to be careful with that when people say things to us. Yeah, it's true. But don't worry about the fall. We have a couple more months to go before fall happens, so you're, you're still good. Thank goodness. Oh, yeah. The pumpkin spice and hoodies have to wait. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. That's good. I'm not a pumpkin spice girl, so I'll take summer and the beach. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Nice indeed. But that's so true, though, because, I mean, it's, it's like especially – when it comes to certain words and you hear it so many times and then that one person who may have the wellest of intentions, they may say something and then you're not sure how to react to it. And then you just go with the, with the default reaction and it's like, Oh, Nope. I do not want to go down the road again where I lose confidence for like five hours and have to do something to get myself back up again. So it, it just shows the power of like, Hey, we gotta be careful of like what are our words that we speak and how we interact with other people. 
Absolutely. How true is that? And I know, you know, as a parent, I, I certainly had the intention to do an out of this world job, just fantastic. And, you know, then you get a child in your arms and realize you have no clue. And even when you're showing up every day, trying to do your best, we make mistakes all the time. And some of that is with our words. So yes, I've learned how important it is. No, I don't think that I am. I, I know I'm not perfect at using the right words at the right time. But I think also that gives you some compassion towards the people speaking to you that they're not always going to find that either. Oh, yeah. And, and I doubt there's any perfect human being when it comes to <laughs> their vocabulary or when they speak or not to speak. That's still an art that everyone has to master. Even a heck, even a metaphorical black belt wordsmith might say something stupid every now and then <laughs> at the wrong time. Right. We're, we are human, which is which is a, a great thing. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Men and women with different hues. Human. Gotta love it. Absolutely. Makes it fun, doesn't it? Heck yeah. From French vanilla to white chocolate to chocolate to dark chocolate. <laughs> I don't even want to know. I, as long as I'm not pumpkin spice, I'm happy. <laughs> oh, man. Well, we'll go with white chocolate then for you. <laughs> right. I mean, that's, cl that's closer. At least. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for giving me that one. I got the pass on the pumpkin spice. <laughs> oh, man. That, that was another whole, whole other can of worms. Like, all right, how do we define pumpkin spice? Who gets that one? Well, I, we'll leave. <laughs> I don't know. That's another, that's a podcast for another day. Yeah, that could probably be another topic. If you, if you do like a solo Jen episode on today, we discover it's me, Jen. Interviewing Jen Taylor. That's right. We're going to discover the race of pumpkin spice. I mean, I could do that. I could have a podcast episode. It's not my normal thing, but it would be a little bit different. So. See, there you go. Have one of your kids dress up with a pumpkin as a pumpkin <laughs> <head> or something. <laughs> one of them. Hey, Gabby, I call her pumpkin. She was born November 7th, and I was so hugely pregnant on Halloween that year almost it, this year will be 20 years that oh, I wow. wore an orange shirt and I drew a Sharpie marker around my stomach and, and then I flattened it out and I made it into a pumpkin. And so she, I guess she would have to be the pumpkin spice girl. Actually, I think I just, I think I just solved the mystery. <laughs> this is fair. I feel kind of like a hero right now. And so, yes, she was born seven days after and I was very pregnant and had a very orange pumpkin head shirt on my stomach uh, now i'm gonna have to find that picture and send it to you <laughs> on, on a linkedin message for so like see it's it really happened this is for real looks like my tricks and treats came early this is great <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. well awesome a day so getting out of high school and able to continue on into early adulthood what was that like for the wonderful Jen? i think i was very blessed and unusual and again i'm going to go back to that teacher in third grade that just instilled something in me that was kind of the fibers of who i am i didn't suffer a lot with self-esteem and confidence i was okay having conversations where maybe I didn't want to be right all the time. I didn't think my opinion was always the way things should be. I was pretty open about that, but I liked to laugh a lot. And I liked to have fun. Uh, I like being smart. I didn't finish college, but uh, I packed my car up and drove cross country instead. I was from New England and I did another semester in college in Idaho and kind of traveled around and, um, I was, I think maybe, I was born in 1970, so I graduated in 1988, and this was pre-internet. I know it's really hard to imagine a rotary phone and a microwave was brand new, and, but I lived those things. And um, back then, you know, I got in my car and packed it and traveled, and I did that for a couple, for, for a few years off and on, actually, even after my first daughter was born. And I think life for me was really good. I was fairly sure of myself. Um, and I thought everything was an adventure. 
And so I don't think anything was bad. I mean, things that happen to you are one thing. That doesn't mean that your life is bad. That doesn't mean that you are bad or you attract all the wrong people. I feel like sometimes we put labels on ourselves, which is worse than someone else putting a label on you. You can ignore other people. When you put those labels on yourself, it's really hard. And I didn't feel like I was a bad person because of the things I had experienced growing up. I didn't feel like I had done anything wrong. I didn't feel like I was broken or damaged goods. I was concerned at other, like in relationships, the that that man's perception of me maybe wouldn't have been the same, but I was pretty, I had pretty decent self-esteem and confidence and I, I tackled everything that it should be a fun adventure. And I think that was a blessing. And, and I was, I was lucky to have people in my life despite the things that happened that were bad or the people that were very negative or the struggles that I went through. And you're right. They, they weren't little, they were pretty big. Um, but I, I knew what I wanted. I knew I wanted to do foster care. I knew I wanted to make a difference. I knew that I loved to write. You know, and you kind of take that with you and it, and thing, life, life hands you things and you choose things and you kind of just roll with it. And I always believe that there's a plan B and that things, you know, could work out in the end. I think I was, I'm like the eternal optimist. Like there's always a plan B. We'll, we'll figure it out. Um, it's helped me a lot because I get lost everywhere I go. I thank God for GPS now. I don't know how I drove cross country so many times before I had GPS, but I'll back out of my driveway and go, Oh my gosh, I'm going the wrong way. You know I mean? Like I just have no sense of direction. But because I knew that about myself, instead of beating myself up about it or being upset, I was like, well, let's see where this road takes us. And I, I know that that attitude probably helped me a lot. And I, I looked at life where I, I feel like I've had a lot of compassion and empathy towards people because I understand even if your struggle wasn't the same as my struggle, I know that hurt and that the journey to get through those things, I I completely understand I am there with you in those moments and that helped me in foster care. Not only had I gone through pretty much every experience that a foster kid goes through, I had gone through it so I could relate to those kids, but also I had a lot of compassion and empathy. Like I get it. I feel you. <laughs> and that probably followed me into lots of other things in my adulthood and the way I work with people and the reason that I wrote the book. Like, wow, maybe I can help one person. Someone took the time out of their life uh, to help me, to make a difference to me and for no particular reason, but I was worth it to them. And so why wouldn't I want to do the same thing that she made me feel like that. I mean, imagine if I could make someone feel like that. And I think I graduated high school and I had, you know, good confidence and I, I wanted to go on all the adventures. And so I, I kind of did. And I, and I did the things that I wanted to do. I think um, we can manifest a lot of what we want. I also looked for people that were more like-minded like that. You know, when I met my now ex-husband, I mean, he knew from the beginning, I want to do foster care and I'm not sure if I can give birth to, I had one daughter, but I don't know if I can give birth to more kids and I've already been through infertility and I don't want to go back. And, um, you know, I was, I think I'm real upfront and honest, maybe a little too boldly sometimes, but that definitely allowed me to manifest the things in my life that I wanted, like doing foster care and having a family. And you know that no doctor's going to tell me that I can't. I just need to figure out a different way that just has to look different for me. And so that's a huge part of my personality. And now, you know, kids are getting bigger and I stopped doing foster care and I'm not, 18's it. <laughs> I've tapped out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everybody's probably like, thank God. I mean, tap out already. Um, no, don't give up. Go to 21. <laughs> you know, I already know. Stop. I already know <laughs> if I got the right call. There's so much where you go with your gut. I'm big on being intuitive and listening to people. And I said no to more foster kids than I said yes to. So although this family is huge, it could have been 
anyone who do, does foster care knows it can be off the charts huge if you, you you just can't take everyone I had to feel like these kids should come into my house it was an intuitive thing that's where I came from it I came from it from a place of intuition and it that it felt like the right fit and the other thing you have to be open for that I didn't see till later but which is okay is that people will say things like oh you must have made such a big difference to those kids and wow you have a big heart and I I want those things to be true I hope I did make a difference to the kids and I think I do have a big heart but they make way more of a difference to me than I could have ever made on them and that I think was unexpected in the beginning because in the beginning I thought oh if I could just make a difference to other people if I could if I could be a public speaker and share my story and make people feel empowered. If I can share my book and people feel un not alone, you know, if I can take in these kids and make them know that they're loved and worth it, but you don't realize the backlash in the other direction. And I have definitely been blessed far more than I've ever given. And that that's a beautiful thing. A beautiful thing indeed, a beautiful thing indeed. Yes, indeed, a gen of all trades. <laughs> I see. I'm gonna have to. T that's going on my LinkedIn profile now. The gen of all trades. So, I'm surprised no one said it sooner. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> nope, nope, never. You're the first one. Oh yeah, that's right. The chocolate wins again. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, I mean, I feel like I could comment, but I shouldn't comment. <laughs> oh, go on ahead. It's a podcast. <laughs> no, no, no. You can just delete. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. I know you have some of those same thoughts and feelings, I'm guessing. I don't want to project that onto you. But I think knowing the little I do about you, you you want to engage with people. You want to create laughter and memories and build people up. Heck yeah, because, I mean, everybody's got a bunch of bricks that they're carrying around with them. It's like, all right, are you going to finish this wonderful cathedral that you are, or are you just going to stay as a one-foot tall brick wall? It's like. Which one are you going to be? <laughs> exactly. And you want to, I want to be connected with people that bring value to my life because I'm still selfish and I want that, but I want to do the same and bring value to other people's lives too. And you think, geez, if we could have this collaborative effort just a little bit and make a difference in people's lives and they wanted to pay it forward, how much, how much different would the world be? Heck yeah. And the most powerful thing is, is the fact that, I mean, people are valuable already. It's like they just need folks kind of like a third grade teacher. She saw value in you that you needed to share with others. And she sowed seeds and planted seeds to help you get closer to realizing your own power. So it, it's, it's not only just about the whole adding value, but just showing people that they already have value to bring to someone else. Okay, chocolate did win again on that one. Yeah, I blame my buddy Chris Jordan from last week. We did a Facebook Live about it because <laughs> he's doing some morning meditation. It's like, wait a second. It, it's kind of like a buzzword nowadays. Like, all right, what value can you add to my audience? What, what value add are you going to do? All this value adding. But it's like, in a way, humans are valuable already. Everybody has a gift and everybody has a chance to share it if you give them the opportunity. So it's like, yeah, they really want to focus on like adding value maybe it's maybe we should change the rhetoric and make it about revealing the value that people already have which is a much better way to state it absolutely heck yeah that's right and the beautiful thing about it is it's not even over yet because there's a big huge mountain to climb of wonderful riches for everybody to take part in not just the gold and platinum but also human kindness. I'm all about the human kindness. That that makes me very happy. And my podcast, I try to interview people about their struggles because I love being relatable to other people. I've never experienced an eating disorder, but I 
but other people have. And so having somebody on who can, who's willing to talk about that and share that again, letting people know that they're not alone, that other people understand them and have been through their struggle. And then it's, it's great to share the tips and tricks that helped get them through that struggle or still helping them get through that struggle and how they are paying it forward today. A hundred percent of entrepreneurs that I have interviewed, their business was born as a direct result of the struggle that, that they've gone through. And I find that so fascinating. I love that information. And I think it's so fantastic that if you're an entrepreneur and you have this business, whatever it, whatever it is, making t-shirts with positive sayings or being a coach or running a, a physical therapy, it can be anything, but they did it specifically with intent to give back in a way that came from the struggles that they've gone through and the things that helped them. And I love finding those connections in people and then giving that information out for others to be able to use. And it's so, it's so empowering. It's empowering for the person who's willing to share. And then it's empowering for the people who are listening that can build on all of this information in their own toolboxes. Heck yeah, that's right. The wonderful mom of 18 has got herself a toolbox, baby. That's right. The warrior princess got a lasso and a toolbox. This is going to be great. I'd like to get a tool belt with suspenders and have the lasso. I think we can get a whole thing happening here around that. And that would, that would be perfect. Heck yeah. We got your Halloween costume ready already. This is great. I think, I think we've got it pretty dialed in. Pretty close anyway. Yeah. I said a foam improvement. It's pain improvement. See, there you go. I just need to have a couple more conversations with you and you can rebrand everything and come up with my Halloween costume, <laughs> which is way better than the pumpkin that I did 20 years ago. Much better. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm making progress at this point. At the way we're going, this episode might be titled Pumpkin Spice with Chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I like pumpkin spice. If you added the chocolate, I mean, we can, I will, I will happily go that direction in some way or another. <laughs> yeah, don't worry, it all leads north. Yes, it all leads north. That's right. Yes, indeed. And that was kind of a powerful statement you said earlier, too, about how entrepreneurs are kind of started from a place of pain in a way and try to like improve it or just finding a need and feeling it. Heck, that's probably what led you to getting to where you currently are. It's like, Hey, I got some mouths to feed here. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah, absolutely. I knew that about myself. I knew I took my struggles and my, my wins, my successes, my third grade teacher, you carry those with you and my years of foster care and raising kids and going through pretty much every struggle you possibly can imagine. I'm sure they'll come up with a couple that I haven't imagined. I'm, I'm not giving up on that yet, but you know, you go through all of these different trials with the kids that I've had and and then I thought, well, how can I continue to give that back? And absolutely. So I knew my business was born out of, as a direct result of my struggle and a way to give back in a way that made sense to me that I was comfortable with in my personality. And I, it didn't occur to me at the time that other people were doing the exact same thing until I started interviewing people on the podcast. And all of a sudden, the light bulb, I thought, holy cow, every one of them has started their business somehow or another as a direct result from their struggles and wanting to give back. So they have taken their pain and they have paid it forward in a positive way. It is just one of the most fascinating things ever. I'm totally, I, I'm in love with finding out that information about people. And I think a lot of us do that in different ways. Even in a society where it's hard not to get sucked into having a bad day or getting mad because you got cut off on the highway or the person at Starbucks messed up your pumpkin spice. <coughs> no chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. And to stay okay. facing North, you know, the North, North is the guiding star. It's Sinusura. And um, to keep that positivity there, there are times in life that that's, that's tough. 
Oh, definitely right about that. It is definitely tough indeed because it's like you got all these random shiny objects just showing up out of the blue. It's like, oh, shoot, got to stay focused. And then you get on the side quest and like, oh, man, uh, how do we get back on the main road again? Yeah. Tangents. See, but that, that can be adventure, too. The tangents can be adventure if you have the right attitude. But you have to have the right attitude for that. Oh, yeah. Then you get to the right altitude, too. Are we going to go Zig Ziglar? Oh, sure. Why not? I'm a big fan of him. I'm pretty sure you are, too. Since you said I, his I, name. <laughs> well, you just, <laughs> you just said altitude, and he's got a saying, and now I'm racking my brain to remember it exactly. I'll, I'll think of it. I will think of it. But you just said altitude. Okay, your attitude, not your aptitude, will determine your altitude. There we go. Woohoo! Woohoo! You gained 10 experience points. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've gotten to level two. Yay! Wait a second. I thought it was high for you. <laughs> Good grief. Where's the... Level one was really long. <laughs> Must have restarted the game again. <laughs> I get something, something. I lost all my lives. I had to start over. Doesn't that say? <laughs> your attitude, not your aptitude, will determine your altitude. See, you said the word, and it triggered Zig Ziglar in me. So there you go. That's right. The legendary Double Z himself, R.I.P., as they say. Exactly. Man, I'm so glad he recorded a lot of his presentations. Good times. Very good, good times. times. Very good times. And Google searches him. So there you go. That's right. Got to thank the Googs. Exactly. Well, and speaking of Googs, it probably leads to goggles that you use to read some fabulous reading materials. Am I diving into a few of your favorite books that have inspired you to write your own or some that you just read for fun or inspiration? You know, when I was a kid... It was The Giving Tree. I still have the copy on my bookshelf. And, I, and I'm and i a minimalist, as you mentioned, so I don't have a lot of books. But I have the original copy of The Giving Tree and the original copy of Are You My Mother. I know those are kids' books, but they can still inspire you. Um, and I think other things, um, there's a book called Wear More Cashmere. Hmm. That I, I yep, yeah, right? I'm going to throw one out there you've never heard about. Wear More Cashmere, I got it for Mother's Day 16 years ago, probably, and it's by a woman named Jennifer Sanders, uh, Sander, sorry, no S, oh. and uh, Wear More Cashmere, 151 Luxurious Ways to Pamper Your Inner Princess. Here I am giving a shout out to my, my twin Jennifer Sander here, and it <laughs> I think a lot of us forget to be kind to ourselves and self-care is a little bit overused at this point. And I think we've kind of gotten lost in what that means, but it's 151 things you can do. And it's, it's directed towards women. She's got like chocolate pudding recipes in here and all kinds of ideas like come up with your alter ego name. Yes, I have one. Thank you for asking. Um, this book was so fun. It was so fun because it celebrates who you are and gives you ideas on how to continue to celebrate who you are in a way that I, I wouldn't have on my own thought about doing. And it just so fun, you know, make your own lobster bisque, uh, family crust, create your own. Just all kinds of different things, some that cost money and some that don't, but I've kept it and it's, it's dog-eared and worn out, and I have loved it because it reminds me that we do need to celebrate ourselves, which is a little different than self-care. It's a little different than just a pedicure, although there's nothing wrong with that. I take gift certificates for pedicures. I'm happy to. But, you know, we need to celebrate our uniqueness and who we are. And kind of remember that she, somewhere in this book, it encouraged me to start like a dream journal, which was really fun. Things that I want to do, even if I'm afraid, like jumping out of an airplane. Um, things that I want to do, kind of like, a, it's almost like a bucket list, sort of, but it's a dream journal. And it helped me remember 
who I am, me, Jennifer, not mom of 18, not the person who has a job, not, not coaching someone who's struggling, it, me, me the person. And I think sometimes in all of the volume of life, we kind of lose track of that. So that is my number one share for a book. Sweet. So lobster bisque and chocolate pudding, huh? Yeah. I mean, at the same time, even you could do it. No wow. holds barred here. Ah, sweet. All the puns intended. That's right. All of them. All, everyone. Yes. <laughs> are the recipes analogies for anything else or are they just straight recipes for the actual meal food item? There are recipes for the actual meal. It's just ways to pamper yourself. And so she gives suggestions. And when she suggests something like lobster bisque, she accompanies it with a recipe. So just remembering, kind of be kind to yourself. We're, we are not perfect. We do have off days. I don't always have the right words to use when I'm in the heat of the moment with a teenager, for example. And that, you know, sometimes if we just take a step back and we're kind to ourselves, and then she gives the recipe to help you be kind to yourself. So yay, it's a win. Oh, yeah, big win indeed. Heck, all the letters capital, like you're screaming it. I think they should be shouty caps for sure. Yeah, shouty caps. <laughs> Almost like a bottle cap, right? Well, I mean, it could be a bottle cap. That would be a completely different conversation. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Another hidden dad joke pops out of the jack in the box. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, indeed. And y'all so are runners. So what's the longest distance you've ran so far at once? Because I've heard of regular marathons and then I've heard of ultra marathons, which are like 100 miles. Yeah. Well, I've trained for three marathons that I've never ended up running. So I've never actually run a marathon. I've run 23 miles, but you know, didn't do the other 3.2, didn't do the last 5K on there. Uh, my favorite distance has been half marathons. So I'm only half crazy. <laughs> See, there you go. <laughs> I run three times a week and twice a week I run with a, a group of women here. All the, like, it's like soccer moms unite basically is my running group, <laughs> but they're amazing human beings. We run four and a half miles on Tuesday and Thursday. It's called the 520 group because we, we run at 520 in the morning. And then on Saturday we go longer. So I did 10 miles the last time on Saturday. So that's my running. That's my, it's, it, it was a great experience in an office I worked at where we were all challenged to a half marathon together. I was totally on board. I had probably never even run a three miles all at one time, but I did that. And what I realized from that is one, there is a thing called runner's high and I like it. And there's a group of people that are so supportive, the running community and at, you know, you finish a race and everybody's cheering and you're excited and you kind of share it. And I thought that is a place I want to spend more time. So I was just hooked after the first one. And uh, that was probably about 15 years ago also. And um, I love it. I love running. I also learned a lot about myself. I'm very extroverted. I have to talk to process. And when I run, I can actually spend some time thinking and processing things internally, which is a little more difficult for me. I never realized, like I would have told you before running, like I'm almost never mad. Oh no, I'm mad. I just don't <laughs> recognize it. And when I'm running, I would realize like, man, I am pissed at something, <laughs> you know? And I got to kind of pound it out physically, but also emotionally. And it may, it was, I felt so great physically and emotionally when I was running that I just wanted to keep going. It didn't start out that way. It took a little while of me running to ever know what runner's high was, just that euphoria that you get from exercise, you know, and it took a while for me to realize how much I, if I don't talk about something, I bottle it and that I could learn the process internally when I'm running. So I know when I run, I'm like, let's see what my brain's got for me today. Because 
sometimes we we don't stop and pause long enough to take the time to really be introspective or I don't take the time to be introspective about how I feel about things or what I'm really thinking or is there something underneath my initial reaction and when I run it's an opportunity for me like I'm solving all the world's problems obviously but I'm also working through my own and my kids learned they used to ride their bikes with me and most of them have done races and they've done aid stations I mean they've been involved because I was involved like most parents involve their kids in things that they're involved with and uh, my kids would look at me and say you know mom why don't you just go for a run and it wasn't because I was yelling and screaming and I was being a terrible mom it's because my kids I allowed them to recognize the fact that it kind of sets things a little right it gives me more clarity it gives me a little breathing room just enough even a couple miles even 20 minutes that I come back a much better version of myself. And so I'm glad that I could allow them to see that, that I'm very imperfect and that there are things that you can do that are healthy for yourself that really help kind of put you back on axis, I guess. And I, I'm glad they saw that. I'm glad that they knew that I was human and that they knew that I could do something physical that didn't hurt anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go beat the person up that I'm mad at, you know, that they could really see that you could make a difference in your own life by just kind of taking a breath and writing yourself. And so that, that's been a great thing with running, but I've only run 23 miles. I do have in my dream journal, I want to do a 50 K. So anything after a marathon is an ultra, like you mentioned. So anything over 26.2, automatically. You run 27 miles. It doesn't count if you get lost. I mean, I guess, I guess it could. <laughs> but anything over 26.2 is an ultra. And a 50K is about 32 miles. But it's on trail. So... A little lower key. Trail races are a little lower key than road races. Road races are a little more competitive. And I like the trail races. And so, see, I'm, I'm spilling about my bucket list stuff. And now it's going to be on air. And anybody that hears it is going to call me on it. So, there you go. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm not as a guy that you don't tell your goals to. I usually remind you of it at the most Perfect. random times. <laughs> <laughs> Are you my new accountability buddy? Oh yes, ma'am, I am. Yay! See? That was an added bonus that I wasn't expecting today. That's right. It's more than chocolate, it's accountability too. <laughs> it's chocolate <laughs> accountability. <laughs> oh yeah. That's right, with all sorts of wrapping. Well, without the Kendrick Lamar type of wrapping. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I could pull that one off, so I'm glad that we're not going that way. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, it's a beautiful thing that you you're just randomly suggested one day is like, just go ahead and start running. And any idea, what was your one of your best ideas after you finished a session of running? Because I know exercise, usually if it's intense, you usually get like this random light out of the sky idea where it's like you got to write it down as soon as you get a chance. To just get some paper. Wow, I feel like I'm feeling as a runner. I don't remember ever having something like that, but my energy does change a lot. I am, it, even though I may not have been in a negative space before, I am in a very obnoxiously positive space after I run. I get more cleaning, more organizing, more just everything done after a run. So I don't know that there was any light bulb moment that happened but I know that it, it carries me through when things are tougher, kind of boosts me up and it gives me a lot of energy to, to do what's needed to be done. And I, so I think it's more even keel for me than light bulb, but I'm going to keep an eye. I mean, I have come up with ideas to solve the world's problems, but by the time you get home and you try to write, it just doesn't, it doesn't translate well. So the world still has problems, clearly, because I didn't fix it all. Yep, the warrior princess had to realize she had to be the queen and take a break. <laughs> exactly. It's like, nope, I'm sitting on my throne now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's right. That'd be like one of your upcoming random uh, random days. Like, you know what? I feel like a real warrior queen today. I'm just going to put on a crown or a tiara today. I don't even own a tiara, and I'm the warrior princess. And I know I'm the queen because I have 18 kids, so clearly I have to be. And I don't own a tiara. Yep. Got I think that's that a tragedy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe not. <laughs> I need to at least borrow one to take some pictures in it. So, you know, it seems like I own one and it belongs on my head. I, I need to do something with the tiara. I'll probably end up going to the kids section of Walmart and finding a toy one. And that's what I'll end up having. But that's okay. Heck yeah. There you go. It'll it'll make for a great post. It will. Heck, maybe even write a blog about it. I think you're manifesting some things in me right now. Um, <laughs> you're depositing ideas, but yes, I I probably I can see that in the future. Woohoo! There you go. It can be the whole. It could be the JT TR of empowerment. I I do need to write that down. I can just get I can just cr transcribe it later. Oh, there you go. That's right. Heck, if, if you even get this far into it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's like oh, I'm like one of those actors. I don't want to hear my old stuff. No, I need to go on to the next thing. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I think we learn a lot if we can be a, a little more retrospective. But yeah, if going back and reading a blog post from eight years ago. And I think, wow, things are different then. I think it's good to go back and read those things. Amen to that, because it's like you get to see how much you've grown and how far you've come from that time. Yeah, that's and that's a huge thing. I actually recently had a comment on a blog that I posted over three years ago. And I, I didn't even understand what the comment was in context to because the blog was three. I, I don't reread my, I don't sit around rereading myself. So I had, but I went back and I, I read the blog that she commented on and put it in context. And I thought, wow, it's so great to see how far you've come and what things have changed and what things have not. And do you want some of those to change or are they good the way they are? So I think it's important to go back and look at things that you've, especially when you're a writer, things that you've written in the past, that, that really drove the point home that I, I could see where I changed and not changed. And do I want to alter any of that? That was a really exciting example for me, actually, to a reminder, I guess, to every once in a while, it's, you should be, we're looking forward so often. We're so focused on looking forward and the goal and the next thing and tomorrow and tonight's Friday and it's the weekend. And I think sometimes pausing to look backwards is super important. I, and I did that for my book. So anyone who goes back in any timeline way takes the time to do that, which was life changing for me. But it was really important. And also that something that I wrote three years ago that was just, it was just a blog post, you know, a little blog post that I had done made a difference to somebody today. That is empowering. That's huge. That's the difference that you can make with people. Oh, yeah. Such an amazing thing. And heck, if, if you write write another book today, you'd probably be like, man, it's like, and you compare like today's book with like the past book and it'll be like, man, it's a completely different thing. It's like you're, it's like the 2019 gen can kick the 2016 gen's butt. Right. And you want that. You, you definitely want that. And I think that that would be the case. One thing I would love to share, when I wrote the book, it's a lot of tough stuff. And tough stuff can be hard to write. I actually, I had to dig deep to get there, but I think I had processed my own pain enough that it wasn't hard in the sense that it was emotional and I was crying and I had to relive it. It wasn't like that for me at all. The toughest thing about writing my book is that if it was a negative person, I didn't use their name. But if it was a person who had been positive in my life, 
then I wanted to use their name. So I found them. Most of them I was in touch with loosely. You know, you, they're kind of peripheral in your Facebook friends. But you kind of keep track of them and you know them and you're sort of in touch. But it's not, well, we didn't talk every day. And I reached out to every one of them. I think there were about 14 people that I asked permission. And when I asked permission, every single one of them said yes, first of all. But also I would write that section of the book about them. And then I would, I would, copy just that section and email it to them. And I wanted to make sure um, that, it, first of all, it was my story, so it was my perspective. So I wasn't asking, hey, is this right? Do you want to add anything? But I did want their perspective of the same situation. I found that to be fascinating. What I didn't realize would happen is that I would spend days the boy I dated my entire junior year of high school and we broke up and it broke my heart. And I spent three days on the phone and messaging him. And I had the unique opportunity to thank these 14 people for the impact that they had made in my life and to thank them for saying yes and to thank them for looking at it. And, you know, if I share a memory with you and you're like, oh my gosh, yeah, and you remember this part, you remember that, you know, it just goes on this whole tangent of other things that happen surrounding that and your memory just explodes at that point it's just not my one singular memory or situation it becomes so much more so I was able to expand on parts of the book because of those conversations but I I spent three days with Kevin on the phone and messaging and not just thanking him but we talked about breaking up which we'd all, we'd gotten past. I mean, it was like 30 years earlier, but I can't tell you how powerful it is to look back in your life at the people who have made a positive impact in you and not just think about them and write it down, but go that extra step and thank them and tell them why. Share the story of why they were positively impactful in your life because there was nothing more powerful and emotional that left me like gut-wrenching sobbing writing my book than being able to have that opportunity to thank those people. It was one of the most beautiful experiences in my life and I recommend everyone go everyone spends days sobbing uncontrollably because of the positive difference people made. It, it's really eye-opening. And the thing that really sucks when somebody is positive in your life is that if you don't take that time, the one person that should know doesn't. And going back and doing a timeline of your life, I could have shared it in the book and never said anything. But how, how much would we have all missed out? And I never thought, I thought, you know, I want to ask their permission and just say thank you. That was my goal. It was a very simple cut and dry. It was not a simple cut and dry. The process was not. It was, it was 14 people and gut-wrenching because you, they, that is the person that needs to know that they made that difference in your life. And that's the person that needs to hear thank you. And that's the person that you should be sharing that memory with. And we don't take the time to do those things. And I think if I could pass one thing on for people to do to change their lives, it would be to do a timeline of your life and notice the people that were positive. And if someone's passed on, that, that can be the case, but you can write a letter to them. You can use it as a blog post. You can hang it on your wall. You can thank the next of kin. You can share the story with, it, it can still be shared even if that particular person is no longer here on this earth because people need to know that they've made a difference and we need more positivity in our lives. So do the timeline of your life and, and share that with the people, the, the one person that needs to know, which is the person that you're saying thank you to. Ah, uh, beautiful thing indeed. And it's great that you shared that, uh, friend of mine for a few months ago mentioned now folks been telling to write a book but he went through some of the writing process and some of it was so painful that he just broke down in tears and he had to give himself days to recover from it it can be that it can be that way there are things that are painful i i mean again whatever is in in who i am in my personality i'm glad it wasn't that it was easy to write the tough stuff it was difficult but I, I didn't have to I had to walk away I broke it down into sections and I attacked them in out of order 
you know, I didn't write the book chronologically, although it's presented chronologically, because I had to, you can't eat an elephant in one bite. I had to take it in manageable chunks. And I, to, I can completely understand him feeling that way and being like that for days. I, I definitely massaged the order that I wrote and bounced around. I also had an amazing, outstanding editor who, you know, I would send her things by piece through Google Docs and she would edit them and we bounced around everywhere. And she was good at recognizing, like, I don't feel like I'm getting the emotion out of you that you could put into this. So I'd like you to, to go to this part and, you know, go back to this. And so she redirected me too, because it can be a devastating process to write a book about something that's really painful. And it was hard for me because there are people still alive there's my mother and my sister and this book was my perception of my life and it was my story and it wasn't to hurt anyone and it wasn't to say the story not in the way they were someone else remembered it it was really about me sharing my memory and my story and it is really tough stuff to write things that are hard to write and knowing that person could pick that up and read it it's really some tough stuff to write that. Oh, yeah. Tougher than a $2 steak, as some would say. That would be, that's tough. Now you're talking, <laughs> you're talking tough. <laughs> 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 Tougher than me drinking a pumpkin latte. <laughs> 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 and that's really tough. I, I they're disgusting. So, <laughs> man, <laughs> there's, there's probably some video of you somewhere that you hid from the world of you smashing a pumpkin, isn't there? <laughs> out of the pumpkin spice. Oh, I'll cut them up. I'll take the seeds out. I'll I'll bake the seeds. I'll eat the seeds. Just no latte, no pumpkin pie. I'll I'll make pumpkin pie. I'm good at it. I only know that because people that like it eat it and say that it's good. I've never tried it because I wouldn't like it anyway. But I I will not destroy the pumpkin. I will actually <laughs> make you the pumpkin pie and bake you up some seeds. I just don't want anything to do with it. <laughs> See, I've gone above my dislike to help others in the pumpkin pie situation. There you go. There you go, right there. One of the tenets of the warrior princess. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not, I'm, I'm almost, I'm starting to get nervous about you quoting me, actually. <laughs> Why? <laughs> you should feel good about it. <laughs> Yay. No, you can quote me. Quote me. I might, I might take the transcript from this podcast and the quotes that you give me, and that will be the next book. Ah, sweet. There we go. That's right. See? There you go. It can be Warrior Princess Fonz Chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going that direction with the title, but now that you mention it. <laughs> I mean, there's no reason not to, right? I mean, heck yeah. I was like, heck, I got a buddy of mine. He has a book he released a few weeks ago called life lessons from the trailer park why trash wisdom from everyone so it's like heck why not right oh my gosh i need to buy that book yep i'll definitely email you the link it, it's a fantastic <laughs> fantastic wow i just think if you have knowledge inside you even if it's trailer park knowledge and you have the ability to share that why wouldn't you do that because other people aren't like you're you're not people aren't challenging you for that title right heck yeah <laughs> it's like everybody's owning up to something but not that one <laughs> no, I, I mean i'm not sure that i would have so i kudos that's right well the beautiful thing is is that you have so much knowledge and wisdom is that the beautiful thing is it's a question I like to ask every guest, and that is if you're to wake up tomorrow and you're 25 again, but this time in 2019, what advice would you give to yourself? Wow. 
Long, longer cougar. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let me stop. <laughs> Shoot. Well, that's the first piece of advice I'd probably give myself. Like, don't discount being a cougar, which I have never done. I've never been a cougar. Well, I mean, Dane, Dane is four years younger, but I, that you have to be like 15. See, I never did that. In my moment of being single, I didn't capitalize on that. That's distressing almost. So <laughs> I think, well, I think I would give myself the advice that I am so much more than I think I am and that there is always a plan B. This too shall pass. And, you know, I, I, to be a little more kind to myself, I, I would definitely gear up on what was to come in relationships, in things that happened physically, how to be able to manage those a little bit better. But I think it just, I would tell myself to embrace myself more than I did and run with it. Oh, yeah. That's right. That was a great callback pun right there. Just run with it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That is true. Woohoo. Well, anything upcoming for the wonderful Jen? I'm pretty sure you got a lot of things in the metaphorical pot cooking. So anything else upcoming for Jen? What's next for the wonderful Jen? A new book. We're expanding the podcast. World domination with kittens. Wow, that one, again, not on the list. I, I think I'm not going to add that one. You've given great suggestions and some direction, but I'm going to not do the kittens. Um, next, on the list for me, I love the podcast. I absolutely love interviewing. I really enjoy being interviewed. I just love the whole platform. So I will keep on keeping on. I'd like to build it more, my audience, of course, like you always want to do. And you know, I did public speaking off and on for 30 years. A lot of it was about foster kids and which I loved and I really miss it. I miss it enough. And it, it's a, it's a tough thing to do to uh, find places to speak that really are a good fit where people are like, yes, we want you come to our stage. And I think as far as the next big thing that I don't talk about, but is percolating in the background is that I, I've really missed public speaking and I'd like to do more of it. I, I believe like the podcast, you can reach a greater number of people and it's, but it's more interactive and you can meet people and I've missed it a lot. So I would really like to focus more time and energy on getting back into doing some speaking. And book two is always in the works, although there's nothing set about that. I, I've started a couple and it just hasn't felt right, but I know that that will happen. I'm going to keep doing the things that I love, the YouTube videos, the podcasts, writing blog posts, you know, doing all the things that I think are fun and awesome. And I, I would love to see more growth in that. And then see, I just let you in on another secret on public speaking. You're getting me to spill. That's right. Spilling all the beans and chocolate pudding. That's what I'm talking about. That's beans and chocolate pudding. Okay. Yep. That is a bad bathroom moment later, but yep. Spilling all of it. Absolutely. Heck, heck spilled milk too for the fun of it. Sure. I mean, we might as well throw that in there. We got beans. So <laughs> it's not like the milk's going to ruin the recipe at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're making lobster bisque, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a recipe for that, just in case. <laughs> Ew. Well, beautiful for the wonderful folks who want to keep in contact with you and all that you're doing. What's the best way to reach out to the wonderful Jen with two N's? Well, you found me on LinkedIn, so that's always a possibility. My website is Mom of 18, and it's the number, momof18.com. All my social media links are there. Everything you never wanted to know about me is either there or on this podcast. <laughs> and I love connecting with people. There's no question that I will ever think is stupid. Uh, I really appreciate conversations and connection. So whether it's Facebook or LinkedIn or the website, 
just jump on and reach out and comment. I, I, yes, I would love to have you as a guest on my podcast of talking about your struggle. Yes, it is a value. Yes, you are perfect the way you are. Don't second guess yourself. Just jump out and get in touch. That's right. More ways than one. That's what I'm talking about. Indeed. Oh, well, it was a pleasure having you, Jen, on the podcast. One of the more funner conversations I've had on the show in a while. Heck, me even have you back on again as you get close to book number two. Absolutely. Heck, maybe if you get in on one of them co-author projects, too, that could work out, too. See, I haven't explored that much, but I think it's a great option. Woohoo! So you and I can write a book anytime you're ready. Yay, there we go. <laughs> Two I'm happy. Yeah, that's right. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much. It's been an honor to be on the podcast. Oh, my pleasure indeed. My pleasure indeed. Any parting words for the folks still listening? Well, they better still be listening. Yes, put it out there. It's worth it. Just put it out there. Yes. The answer is always yes. Write the book. Put the blog post up. Do your before and after pictures. Whatever it is you're struggling with, do it. Hey there, you superstar. Thanks a bunch for making it this far in the podcast. Hope you really enjoyed it. Heck, if you made it this far, that means you really enjoyed it. Be sure to shoot the guest an email or head over to the social media pages and leave them a nice response that you heard them on the Going North podcast so that way they can continue to be inspired to do great things. And be sure to share this podcast with others that you think would enjoy it as well because we want to inspire as many people as possible to live their dreams, embrace them, and to do something positive.